All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is John Pavone. I'm from Aspect Security, and I'm here this afternoon to talk about uh, growing a strong AppSec program. And, and I'm going to go through some things here. First of all, welcome to San Francisco, AppSec USA. Beautiful day out here, and I have you trapped in this room. So uh, sorry, that's all I can say. But I'd like to be out there, too. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to talk about today is uh, with an AppSec program, you know, we get enamored by tools, we get enamored by volumes, we go after volumes, and we spend a lot of time in that wheel. And when you get to an AppSec program, it's not just about volumes. There's a lot more about the people and process around that, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. I'd like to get a, a little feel of the audience. How many folks here are involved in an AppSec program today? Good. Great show of hands. Folks that are um, higher levels, like CISOs. Okay, we have one. All right. And how about developer types? Leads? How many vendors are out there? It's okay. Um, so, let me, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm basically been around this industry for a long time, um, and I'm old. Been in this thing for about 25 years. I grew up on the IT side of the house, uh, developer, technical lead, became architect, and um, in my dealings in the financial firms, primarily uh, at Vanguard Investments, uh, trapped me in the hall one day, and they were putting a website up, and this was like 94, 95, and they said, hey, John, we want you to secure this thing. We don't know what that means, but go figure it out. So uh, a lot of trials and tribulations from there. Um, built out a security program for Vanguard, uh, was their lead chief security architect at the time. And then in 2006, I joined Aspect. And one of the main reasons I joined Aspect was to continue down the AppSec program route and uh, built out AppSec program services for, uh, for the uh, consulting firm that now I am officially CEO, which is kind of recent. Not really sure what that means yet, but I'm getting there. You know, I'm figuring all that out. I, uh, Primarily, most of my work has been developing AppSec programs and uh, helping organizations get better in doing that. Um, big family man. I have a large family on my side. My wife, we're an integrated family. We have five adult children. And this is where I like to spend most of my time when I'm not doing all the security work. So uh, uh, big in the families. Nieces and nephews are all a lot older. My kids are not having kids yet, thank goodness. But my nieces and nephews have. and. You know, you get through a lot of these things and you start trying to figure out what life is all about. And then, you know, you go home one day and you start holding a little baby in your arms and everything is forgotten, right? That, that's what it's all about. It's, uh, you know, the ability for that baby to trust you. You're holding that baby and then you want that baby to grow up big and strong. So, you know, they trust you and they trust you to do the right things for them, right? Just like your consumers, your clients trust you. You do the right things for them. So it's important for us to get this AppSec program right. So today I'm going to talk about this balanced meal plan. Um, and you know, I, I can speak for apps, about AppSec for you know, five, five, six hours. I'm going to touch on key points and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the futures that we see in this space. Um, talk about some of the key areas, um, what's expected for AppSec. Do you know what's expected? When you're running your AppSec program, do you know exactly what you're looking for at the end of the day? Um, that's a big question out there. We'll get into that. A sponsorship and governance is very important. I know sometimes we get, uh, you know, we, we resist that, but it's very important in, in an AppSec program. Awareness, visibility, we get into. Then developers. Developers make, you know, you talk about scale, talk about speed. Uh, and a lot of folks turn to tools as well on that, and it's a very important automation is a big piece of that, but people is a big piece of that as well. So empowering and getting away and coming away with self-empowered developers is very important. And then we've got this concept of breakers and builders. We spend a lot of time on the break side, and we need to start building up the build side of the house and balance it, right? Not to say we got, and you can't just, you have to do break, you have to do both. You have to do it in a balanced form in a uh, balanced way, excuse me. So what is SDLC? I get this question a lot when I'm out of client sites. Um, with my 25 years, I've, 
started trying to do the math the other day about how many of these AppSec engagements have I been on uh, where we're trying to make AppSec programs or developing some you know, particular portion of an AppSec program. And I, I think I'm about over 40, and whenever I get this question of, you know, we just want to secure SDLC, it's, that's all we want. That, that's our AppSec program. And, you know, what is that? Right there it tells me that there's an awareness issue, there's a training issue, and we need to try and make uh, an understanding of what really we mean by secure SDLC. Because in most organizations, you have secure SDLCs, a lot of them, and you have to take care of all the different types of life cycles you have in your organization. We'll talk about that as well. So the goal of an AppSec program is pretty simple. You want to make sure that you have visibility into what is happening. You know exactly what to expect and what's, what's there actually in your AppSec from a risk standpoint. And if you notice on this whole thing, there's no, you know, there's no uh, vulnerability listed here. It's all about risk. It's all about reducing risk over time. It's about increasing coverage across your app portfolio. Vulnerabilities will be found with some of the techniques we use, but we always have to translate that into risk. So out of the, the 40 plus AppSec programs, uh, and that's been over a span of 10, 15 years, um, there's, out of those 15 years, we always come back to the same ingredients, the same components that make up an AppSec program. I've been through, I don't know how many generations of technology advancements, I don't know how many different types of development processes I've been through in my career, but at the end of the day, you know, it's these components that are important in any AppSec program. So if you're building an AppSec program, you should be able to answer each one of these and they, to what level you're responding to these particular key components. And uh, these components are important to understand how you, the path you want to take through them. Every company is a little different in maturity. They have, sometimes you get lucky and you go into a company and they have money and they have sponsorship and you go in and you start from the top. And when you do that, you have a pretty good path going through your AppSec program. You know how to string it together. The hard part is tailoring it to the culture and to the organization uh, that, you're, that you're actually working on. Um, but a lot of times you don't have that, uh, the budget or the sponsorship, so a lot of the work becomes some skunk works that maybe start you know, back on the back end and then turn into something that uh, becomes a program. So in some cases you have to get to the point of getting program sponsorship in order to move your program forward. And then there's others when we go into organizations and again, when we go into organizations to do AppSec work, it's typically larger organizations, Fortune 100 type companies. And you, know, you uh, discover all kinds of capabilities. Maturity within different areas, different departments within that organization that you can leverage. So many times what we see is coming from both angles. Some departments within an organization might be strong on the verification side of the house and the technology side of the house where other organization, other part of the organization is more on the governance and uh, risk and compliance side of the house. So bringing those two together is important. So it, it, vary, it varies. I don't think there's any two of the AppSec programs that I've done uh, that are alike, they have these same ingredients, but when you get into their actual implementation and their actual tailoring, they're very, very, very tailored to the, uh, the subject matter, which is the organization we're working with. It starts with executive sponsorship, no support, no budget. Um, so you, you need to figure out a way to get um, visibility to a certain level to the executives and to the, get the sponsorship. And the only way I've seen is you can't go to them, to them with a chart of, look at all the vulnerabilities in our apps. It doesn't mean anything. Cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, uh, they don't know what you're talking about. They're just like, all right, fine, run the tool, get rid of them, and you know, leave me alone. No, don't, don't come back to me. If you can't put it in real business terms and make it real for the business, you need to go back and continue doing your homework, okay? Um, what we found to be most effective is to look at the breaches, look at the data of vulnerabilities you have, and make sure, <coughs> excuse me, make sure that you're bringing them to real business impact. You know, show them, bring a roadshow where this particular threat in the industry 
represents itself in our applications, in our business, and this is the impact it can cause to our business, whether it's financial impact, it's availability impact, whatever the key drivers are, that typically uh, brings home some, some governance and brings home some of the, uh, the budget that you need to proceed on, a, on an AppSec program. This is not that um, easy. It takes time. I've been with companies that it's taken a year, over a year, to, just to get some level of executive sponsorship. So um, you, you need to really, and, it, and it's not a losing cause either. That year that you spend, you're actually doing some good things. You're getting some good data, data that you didn't have because you couldn't get executive sponsorship before. So um, do not think of it as a lost cause. It is something that you're striving towards. Um, the one thing that typically happens, though, and I would say about a good percentage of our uh, work, I would say 70%, is because an event happened. Some incident occurred, and now all of a sudden there's a check been written and go fix it. And mandates get done, and policy gets drilled down to everyone, and you start, you develop a hammer, right? And everybody loves to use the hammer because they think that's the best way to get AppSec done. If I have people, the executive behind me, they're giving me a paycheck and they're giving me a hammer, I'm set to go. You'll go nowhere. You'll make some strides, you'll do some tactical things, but you will lose friendship. <laughs> the friendship you need, the relationship you need with your developers. Because at the end of the day, if you don't get in with the developers, AppSec will not occur for you. All right, AppSec is, you know, it's, it's applications. And the people that develop applications are developers. So if you, you cannot, work with them in a relationship in a collaborative way, you're not going to go anywhere with AppSec. So the hammer might be good to get things started, but immediately try and get that plan to get the hammer out and put it back in the toolbox and start working on some collaborative things with the development teams. Um, and a lot of times when you have the hammer, the developers and IT project leads and managers, they figure out how to game it, right? They, all right, just tell me what I have to do for you to get off my back and make sure I can check that box. And then when I check that box, leave me alone, right? Move on. So you're really not doing any app security at that point. You're just checking boxes and filling forms out and that type of thing. So you want to avoid that. It starts with knowing where you are. So I suggest um, no matter what size organization you have, uh, start with understanding your baseline, where you are from a capability standpoint. Um, OpenSAM is what we use as our tool, and we refined it over the years, but uh, it's subjective. All these are subjective. People are probably using BSIM out there uh, as well, and you have to realize that it's not an exact science, but it is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool in baselining where you are from a function and practice standpoint. And from that standpoint, you can then have the attention of management. Management loves this kind of stuff, right? IT initiatives that are out there are all based on some level of maturity model, whether it's you know a, a maturity model in operations with ITIL or if it's a maturity model on the development side for quality, whatever it might be. Um, these things speak volumes. But um, the one caution I have with, with this when you go through a capability assessment, it's, it's a way to baseline and get you started to measure. So when you, when you start getting your results from the baseline, you know, you'll, you'll see where you are maturity-wise. Again, not an exact science. You know, people start picking apart. Was that a 2.4 or a 2.3 or, you know, all right, whatever. It's a 2 point something. It's not where we want to be. So let's just call it 2 something and, and move on. So uh, let's not get into all the, the, the numbers here. It's more about setting the milestones and understanding what the capabilities are. Uh, both OpenSAM and the other maturity models like BSIM, they provide the definition of what a maturity level looks like. And that gives you some guidance, right? But that guidance is not your AppSec program. I talk to many people that say, well, what are you doing for your AppSec program? Well, I do OpenSAM or I do BSIM. You're doing a capability assessment model for your AppSec program model? I, I, don't see how you could do that. That's not a project plan. It's not a implementation plan. It's not a roadmap. And it has nothing to do with your organization. So um, valuable tool. You should baseline yourself and make sure you reevaluate yourself as you go through your program. 
So that, that's where the value of this particular tool comes in. On the other side where you see the organizational chart and you see this uh, thing that looks like a little bit of a Gantt chart, that's the detail. The capability assessment's easy. You go through a series of interviews with different roles within your organization and then you come away with a maturity score. But the right side takes weeks, months, because you need to understand the culture of the organization you're working in and understand what drives them, what doesn't drive them. You know, the, the capability assessment might, might say, hey, you need to be able to take your verification to a level, you know, where you're doing uh, automated scans on a, on a build process, whatever it might be. Well, you're nowhere near set for that yet. You know, you're, you're still at the beginning stages. So you, you need to really tailor it. You also need to understand IT versus business versus operations and how they all work together. So again, the, the tailoring of this is very important. Spend the time to not just use guidance from OpenSAM and from BSIM, but do not make that your AppSec program. The other thing you want to do early on is if you're a large enough of organization, you typically have some governance and you have a GRC system or some government framework or some policy like a PCI compliance type of deal that you're following. Um, you want to build the bridge right away. So anything you do in your AppSec program, whatever comes out as an artifact of your AppSec program has a, a, a line of sight to your uh, governance framework. That line of sight is very important because at the end of the day, AppSec is not as important as governance, risk, and control. I'm sorry, it's just not. <laughs> all right, I know we all want to think it is, but at the end of the day, the auditor speaks and the auditor's louder than all of us. So and stop fighting it and join it and team up. But don't just take what's going on in the governance structure and just use that. You want to represent application security, but you want to have a bridge to your governance and risk and compliance. Eat your own policy. I see a lot of times I go in, you know, we, we collect artifacts. We want to understand what is the InfoSec policy? What does it look like? And we start reading through it and you realize that, you know, parts of this policy I can't even understand, number one. Second thing is I'm not sure how the development team or the IT team in general knows what to do with this policy. So um, one of the things we do right off the bat is make sure you only put policy that you can implement and you have can bring, you know, provide guidance and measure and you can actu actually represent it in a, an application viewpoint. So make sure that you're just not throwing policy over the wall. Make sure that it has been vetted and that it is something that the application teams know what that means. This is tough work. It's not easy work, but it's important because um, you know, put yourself sometimes in a developer's seat or a project manager's seat. They get hit and, they're getting hit with InfoSec on, on the business uh, and, the, and the governance risk and compliance. You're throwing them a bunch of security requirements plus a bunch of volumes on top of everything. Uh, they don't know where, 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 where to go next, right? And everything's coming at them in different languages. So it's very important to make sure we do this translation. So for the first thing you want to do is know what you have. You know, what is your application portfolio? A lot of times if you do have a governance risk and you know, compliance type or some, some uh, type of business continuity plan within your organization, you have a starting point of the business systems at least and the applications underneath those business systems. Um, but a lot of times when you go to those inventories, so I, I see two extremes. One is the high level where you get the governance inventory or the business continuity inventory, and then you have the asset repository on the other end in the operations world where it's every little minute you know, library in that thing. So it, there's no balance of what an application inventory looks like. But once you do get the inventory, uh, a lot of times when you look at the inherent risk of these applications, they're typically based on data classification and they're based on uh, business impact. There's a lot more factors that go into it when we talk about application security. What's the attack surface look like? Is it hosted outside, inside? Are there interfaces to third parties? Is it you know, talking to the cloud services? You know, what is the makeup of the application? And that will, the attack surface plus the technology that's used and the user base all make up an inherent risk. So one of the things we do right off the bat is come up with some calculation of inherent risk. 
and I say calculation, some score. It doesn't have to be a numeric necessarily, but it has to be something that takes more than just data classification and business impact into account. You need to be able to understand the application and its technology profile, its footprint, and its attack surface. Once you have those, then you can start weighting those things and start calibrating some level of inherent risk. Because this is going to get you started. This is going to get you started where what are the applications in my inventory, which are the most critical ones. There's the ones I want to, you know, if I get $10, I'm going to put $10 in the first bucket over here. I'm going to start from there and move forward. Um, without that, you, you're, it's a free-for-all. I know a lot of organizations, they set up a pen test team and you know, whoever comes to them and does a pen test, they'll do it. And that, that's great, but how about if it's one of those applications all the way at the minimal risk area and how are you prioritizing? You, know, you should be knocking on the door of the high risk applications because that's the one that's most important to your organization. So this gets you started in getting a sense of what your application and its portfolio looks like from a risk perspective. So next couple slides, I want to just talk about, you know, we, you know, uh, Alex, I don't know if you guys were here for the, uh, the kickoff speech this morning, but uh, he, he, just, he had used the word real. What's real, right? And he threw out, you know, we're, we're all focused on these vulnerabilities, but what do we expect? What, what do we want out of app security at the end of the day? So, you know, if you can drive these policies down to standards and requirements, or at least understand the threats and start understanding what defenses that we want to have in every application, you're starting to you know, balance out that build side a little bit more. So one of the things you want to do is look at what, what's out there, what do you have, and can you define it? Can you define what to expect in, when we talk about application security? And then when we try and look at what are we actually doing, we turn to all of our testing that we do, either pen testing or we're throwing out there uh, dynamic scans or we have people to come in and do a manual test. Those are all different things, activities that are bringing vulnerabilities to the table. But when you combine them together, not necessarily line up because you're breaking over here and you're trying to build securely over here and how, how are you bridging those two things? And a lot of times you see a lot of waste and you see a lot of things that are just not tested. So at the end of the day, you come back and say, yeah, we're secure. We ran through our pen test and we ran through our automated scans and we're good to go. Well, are you? Did, how do you know you've done due diligence on your expected model? I remember there was a series of tests and a one of our clients was running and uh, they, you know, SQL injection was one of the top uh, risks that they were trying to stamp out across their organization. Well, they were testing against every app, apps that didn't even talk to a database. Like, why? Like, why, why are we doing that? So it's just we're, we're just we're just shooting blindly sometimes at these things, and I think we have to just step back and look at it. Because at the end of the day, we really don't know if we're really secure. You know, what does what, what secure mean? And, and I think that is the challenge with an AppSec program. We have to get that expected model and what's actually being done and try and marry those together so we have reality of what AppSec is. So what defines secure? Um, I, I, I'm to blame on this, you know, coding standards and requirements, and I used to have a book of requirements and coding standards I used to hand to the client and say, yeah, you have your developers do all of this. And like, yeah, great, we'll give them a big binder of all these things they have to do and they'll get shelved and never looked at, right? So um, that's evolved and the simplistic approach is a good approach. Take it, take it uh, a step at a time and keep it very simple. You know, maybe say something like there's eight areas that you have to be concerned or eight key requirements of security and that's it. So all you have to worry about eight things and define those eight things and start putting some taxonomy around those eight things. And no matter what you do in your AppSec program, whether it's training, whether you're doing a threat model, whether you're going in and doing a lunch and learn or an outside organization like Aspect comes in and does a pen test, continue to speak this language. Do not revert to whatever language the tool's giving you or whatever the vendor's giving you. You have control when you run your AppSec program. Define what you expect to security to be. Uh, one of the things that has been real valuable is to, to define each of these areas in a way that can be talked about in a generic way. Authorization is a good example. 
you know, with authorization, you always have to have policy enforcement points, right? Policy decision points, you have to have a policy store. So when you take a look at this, you can design an, a, a model for authorization. And I don't care if you put, you know, a PeopleSoft HR app against this, or you put a web app against this, or, you know, some type of um, client server app. The, this still applies, no matter how you look at it. So um, when you start thinking about that, you can then start representing the different access or authorization controls you might have. You might have SiteMinder, you might be using Spring Security, or you might have a homegrown RBAC system that you have. You define it the same way, you use the same terms, you see, use the same way of looking at it. And then if you take a step further and say, hey, when we have access control, these are the common threats that authorization typically uh, get so it starts educating so all these are educational tools as well for your developers to work with them and to get a common language out to them this is all design work it's all around security design and architecture but it goes a long way in having the conversation because you're actually talking a little bit more the developer language here than you are throwing a bunch of vulnerabilities at them and trying to ask them to fix those things, right? That doesn't typically work in this particular area when you're talking with developers. The other thing you can do is start putting architecture, reference architectures together. So you might take a look at your HR system or you might go in and take a look at a mobile or cloud implementation and create a reference architecture of what it looks like, what it should be, where the security controls should be, where the attacks based on our business, where the key threats are to that, and then identify um, the, the controls that, that are required across those things. Now you can start providing a little bit better guidance on this one architecture, reference architecture, that can cover a host of applications within that particular area. Uh, this is very powerful when your company is transforming to new technology. We're moving to the cloud. We're going to be doing everything in the cloud. It's great. Let's create a reference implementation of what cloud, secure cloud looks like. And let's start working with the developers early on in that so we can get them to, we're speaking the same language all the way through. Um, again, great training vehicle, great learning vehicle for uh, the development shop to work with. And it's, th these are more collaborative type things, right? And you say, how do you scale this? Well, I'm not asking you to do this at every application level, every instance of an application, but if you look across your organization and take a look at the, the types of architectures you have, it's a finite set. You marry that up against the inherent risk of some of these applications on their architecture, and now you have a list of things you can go that, are ta that you can tackle. And it's not about scale here. It's about education. It's about getting developers to understand what security means and you're providing a, a canvas, a template for them to use. Training and awareness, we know that this is a critical component to any, any AppSec program. Um, the more the developers on board with you, uh, the better. Oh, the, the one other thing about, I, I missed on this one here, is when you're sitting in a room, you can't do this by yourself as a, as a security person, you have to get the architect or tech lead or someone involved from the development team. When you're sitting in that room and you're actually drawing these things out, and I physically mean drawing them out, everybody says, oh, waste of time, it's not scalable. That's not the point. The point is you're in this room with somebody that can influence the development organization and you're talking security in their language. And they start getting it. And once they start getting it, 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 it spreads like wildfire. I never met a developer who didn't want their app to be secure. They just don't understand, right? They don't understand it, and, and, and they get overwhelmed. You're throwing a bunch of vulnerabilities at them, and you've got a business, you know, pounding on them to get things out the door. So we all know the evidence of training. We're still way behind on this. There's, you know, training and awareness has become more of a learning. And, you know, I, I can spend the whole thing on this. Uh, I, I'll throw out there's uh, Chris Romeo. Are you in the crowd, Chris? Hey. How are you? Chris has a great talk tomorrow um, on uh, the learning experience of what happened in Cisco there, and he's done some fantastic work there. So 
great uh, subject area, and he can do much more diligence than I can in, in a couple minutes here. But I think the key thing that I always look at is there's all different types of learners, and there's different styles of learning. Um, this came out of some of the research that our analysts have done that are, are doing some of our training work. And everything we do in an AppSec program, we look against these types and these styles and see which ones we're actually uh, you know, going after and which ones we're actually fulfilling. And whether you're doing something that is um, measurable in the sense that you know, you're, you know, different activities that developers get involved in, they get a particular you know, score or they get a particular grade or whatever it might be. Um, I know there's the belt system that I've seen out there in training. I've seen a lot of areas that go into gamification with this. But there's a lot of ways. Training is not just throwing a bunch of instructor-led training and e-learning. At, at developers, right? You have to combine that with a learning experience, right? Not to say that they're not important. So let's tackle Secure SDLC. Um, first of all, there's, there's not one. Uh, most of your organizations I know are probably not in one SDLC, even if you have an SDLC. But you, you know, some are doing still your traditional waterfall. Some are doing some level of agile and um, a lot of the organizations we're working with today are, are dipping their toe in that DevOps space, you know, and doing some good DevOps type of work. So all of these require attention. And when you take a look at the um, security activities or assurance activities, they're common across all of them. You know, we want to introduce threat modeling and the ability to understand how to do secure design and implementation and code and secure testing and deployment. So these are typical activities that we see in every secure SDLC. It's just how they manifest themselves in the different processes and the different assets that you are actually maintaining or having your IT infrastructure. So these need tailoring as well. But the first thing you have to do is define them. So well, we can't define it because some of our stuff is DevOps and some of our stuff is waterfall. and some are, It doesn't matter. A threat model is a threat model, whether you automate that or not. It depends on the process is driving it, and there's, there's, that's why you know, DevOps is getting so much promise out there for security is because it's kind of forcing us to automate a lot of different things within the pipeline, which is great. I think it's awesome. DevOps by itself does not equal security. I know some people were saying that out there too, but it's a great catalyst for you. So let's talk about all the different types of secure SDLC integration strategies. Um, we can go from manual type of activities to automate it. We have different things like waterfall, agile, right? Like I said, continuous integration. We start to see a lot of folks trying to build integrate their scans, right? So they're putting in a continuous integration model into their SDLC so they get scans on every time code is checked in. Um, Continuous delivery is kind of the precursor of a true DevOps, right? And then got this concept of sensors, you know, being able to get finite little things across and then built in across your development so that security is taken into account at a unit test level, if you will. Um, but that's not it. There's more to it. And really, it's not SDLC. It's kind of just LC because it's a life cycle. Because when you're talking about, you know, how about third party or legacy apps? I always get that. Well, 70% of our apps are still legacy apps. What are we doing about those things? Well, you should have a secure SDLC. It's probably in a maintenance and enhancement mode, right? But you should have these tasks and identify whether they're relative or not. Your mitigation plan and your secure design for these might be things like WAFs and things like that. But at least you've thought through it and you've identified how they get incorporated into your SDLC. You also have third-party products. And that should have a life cycle as well. So all of these things in your inventory should be addressed, and you should be creating a, an integration strategy with each one of them. We typically see a, you know, the typical maturity path we see in organizations is they start with assessment work and mostly security testing. And then they start thinking about, OK, uncle on the volumes. I'm getting way too many of them. I got to start fixing them. Because every time I give a volum to a developer, next time I test it, the volume's still there. Or it's manifested itself in a different way. So you know, we're starting to move from the assessing kind of world to a remediating world. And then you know, at the scale, we'll start to see a lot more automation come into play. I say most of us 
are in this particular area today moving forward. So this is a, a mouthful here. This is a waterfall SDLC example. All right, and I want to point out a couple pieces here. One is, um, I don't know if this thing will work. Let me try it. Yeah. So down here is where the security subject matter expertise will be putting together the expected model. And then that expected model will manifest itself into um, guidance in how to conduct threat modeling, how to do security design, how to do coding in the development life cycle. And as I mentioned before, there's always a bridge to your risk management framework. So when you talk about integrating or doing secure SDLC, you should be taking all these things into account when you're building your uh, integrated SDLC or secure SDLC. These are all important. Now this, this is a manual, right? And there's a lot of manual. You can automate a lot of different things. The one thing that you'll get when you have an expected model is automation is a lot easier because you know what you're looking for and you know how to go after it. A lot of times when you start trying to automate, you, you just, you know, either pointing and shooting, you don't know what you get out of it. Well, but if you, you're running these automated uh, tests and you're converting the vulns into what is expected, what controls or what security requirements are expected, then you have, you know, if you will, test traceability like you would typically have in a development life cycle. But we have to, you know, talking about scale a little bit here, when we talk about scale, we have to take the whole portfolio into account. So when we look at, you know, the more critical and less critical apps, the first thing we have to look at is how do we get broad coverage? And that is typically some scan automation or something like that as a strategy. You want to get broad coverage across your whole portfolio. Let's not forget the most critical apps, they need deep dives, and they're important. So when you put your assurance approach together, make sure that you're spending time on those critical apps and you're not just running a scanner on them, checking the box and saying, I'm secure. They, they require much, you know, much more rigor from a standpoint of assurance. And then the feedback loop is the thing that's typically missing and everything. The, you know, these are all isolated tasks. I run my scanner over there, these guys do pen testing over there, and never shall the two meet or talk or speak or I don't understand why that happens, but it's your job in running an AppSec program to bring those parties together because that feedback loop is important. That's the thing that's going to deepen these scans. If you're just doing a whole lot of work and you're trying to do build integration or continuous integration with scan automation, but you're not bettering it or you're not improving it as you're doing it, I think you're wasting money at the end of the day. You run the numbers, the numbers do not look good if that's all, if all you're doing is onboarding apps in that particular environment. So it's important that you get a feedback loop, not just from what you've seen and what you've done, but also from the guidance and remediation that you're providing as a subject matter expert. And then finally, you'll move into more like in a continuous improvement model. So again, just a, a high level graph here to kind of show an approach that um, can make portfolio assurance uh, reality. But again, without that expected model, it's going to be very difficult to understand whether you are getting coverage or not. Because at the end of the day, you want coverage to increase over time and risk to come down over time. Not vulns, but risk. Okay, I keep on saying that because you can have a ton of vulns in your, in your portfolio, but you could still be decreasing your risk if you're doing it the right way and you have the right understanding of where those vulns, what business risk those vulns are bringing to the table. Next thing is know your tools. Uh, we get enamored by these things. I think every technique that is done out there, dynamic, static, and, and interactive, now you're starting to see RASP out there as well. Um, these are all powerful tools, can do a lot of good for you, but you know, you have to get past marketing, right? You do not let marketing guide you on what you do with a tool. Uh, get real with the tool as well. Make sure it's providing value. Um, there's a, a talk on the benchmark, OWASP benchmark project that Dave Wickers is doing at three o'clock. I'm not sure what room it's in. I'm not sure if it's in this one or the next one. But um, this is one project that's trying to bring 
um, some facts and some uh, ability for us to understand what tool can bring, not tool, but really technique. What's the technique, static analysis, what's the, what's the best at? And if you are going to have a feedback loop and deepen that scan, what's it really covering in your expected model? These are important, important facts for us. So this, this benchmark project is getting a lot of steam and it's probably getting a lot of controversy too, but that's okay. Sometimes you gotta shake it up out there to make things real and, uh, and that's okay. I think uh, you'll find some things out there about the benchmark that's important for, uh, for you to understand what these techniques and tools do. Also, you have to look at where you're integrating into your SDLC. Um, if you're, you know, the only thing you can do is um, get to your code, you don't have a real good integration model where you have your application integrated on interval, but you're having code actually checked in on a regular basis, then a continuous integration model makes sense. You get the build server, you start, you know, identifying your requirements, excuse me, your expected model there, and then you have to provide support. Everybody says, oh, you get a tool, you slap it in, you're done. That's ridiculous. There's a lot of work here with the tool. You have to understand the total cost of ownership. But if you get a feedback loop going where the scan is happening, you're remediating, and your subject matter expertise on your team are involved at the right interfaces here, so you're triaging results, you're putting feedback back into the scans, then you got something going. And when you bring remediation guidance to the developer, it's not what comes out of the tool, it's the tailored stuff. So if it's something that you've modeled in a reference architecture, that's what you should be referencing in your remediation. That's bringing it all together, if you will. Um, Jeff uh, Williams did a lot of talks on this continuous AppSec and getting into this world of sensors. I think this is, a, this is the future of DevOps. Um, this is not easy. There's a lot to it. It looks a lot easier when I just play it on the slide here but there's a lot of things that go into it. Our typical way of running all these different techniques is to you know, get the application to a point and then run it you know, at a particular milestone or a particular juncture. But the, the reality is if we wanna move at scale and speed, um, you're gonna have to distribute these things across the life cycle. And each one of these techniques, or each one of these um, uh, ways of verifying or attacking, if you will, both breaking and verifying build have to be very discrete and they have to be integrated at very discrete locations within that pipeline to make it work. You cannot get in the way and you know, slow down DevOps, if you will. This is gonna require all kinds of collaboration with developers. This is not something that security teams just gonna go off and do and here, you have all your sensors. Just put them in your DevOps, you're all good to go. Put them in a config and they'll, you know, Puppet and Chef will take care of everything for you with that, right? It, it's not, there's a lot of collaboration with developers that you have to do. This changes our staffing considerations. Back in the day, we used to have a pen test team and we used to have a lot of security and subject matter expertise that made up your AppSec team. Um, you have to scale your people and you're only given four or five or two. I don't know what the number is within your organization. So being creative on you know, team expansion is important. How are you going to expand your team if you're using a hammer with developers? Is that, you're not gonna do it. What developer would wanna come to work with security? But if you're actually sitting around the table with them doing security architecture, their architecture, their application, and you're teaching them security, you're gonna find some developers that are really excited about this space. So getting them involved and getting it early. So everybody says that these activities sometimes are, are they're not scalable and they're manual. They're, they're there for a purpose and it's not just about getting the activity of a threat model or an architecture done. It's about the collaboration with the development team. Being able to sit in a room with a development team and talking about their app and then, and you know, Alex mentioned this this morning as well, is a positive attitude and get rid of the no, you know, work with them. It's amazing when I do these architecture uh, uh, security reviews with clients, they are, you know, the developers are all over it. They're taking pictures of the board, like I've never seen my architecture like that. It's pretty cool, you know, so you start building that relationship with these guys and that's what you need to do to expand. Um, 
you'd need a pretty influential project manager to make this happen. Someone that's going to be able to influence the whole organization. Uh, where I've seen successful AppSec programs is when somebody high level in the IT uh, organization actually starts managing an AppSec program. Uh, there's a lot of leverage there that can be used. Uh, architects are important. The learning management, you need someone that gets, can bring learning management to the table and have creative ways in making this a cultural change in an organization. And then um, you, know, you always need someone who can speak risk and speak vulnerability management. Uh, automation DevOps, data scientist, I think these are also roles that you know, we, we actually started uh, putting out some requests for DevOps folks because we're starting to get a lot more of the DevOps uh, type of requests out there. It's, it's different breed than what we're used to. We're used to having a security consultant doing pen testing out there. Now it's all of a sudden, you know, they need help with automating, you know, these sensors, if you will, into their, into their uh, application pipeline. And then if you, what are you going to do with all the sensors data, right? It has to go somewhere. And how do you model that? And how do you bring that all into, you know, you used to talk about a risk register for vulnerabilities. Well, what's going to capture our expected model? What's going to capture all these sensor outputs of discovery and verification? There's a lot of data. A lot of data has to be manipulated. And you're going to see that being something in the future um, that comes into play. I have a couple slides on vulnerability analysis. Again, uh, vulnerabilities should come back and be mapped back to the root cause, the, the control that's weak, right? So if you have cross-site scripting, is it because you know, lack of output encoding is the control, right? Or is it you know, SQL injection is the parameterized query? So you, you need to understand um, that when you convert this to the language that you already started talking to developers with, they'll understand it a lot better than just throw them a cross-site scripting or you know, cross-site request forgery. So being able to convert or map that vulnerability that's been found to the root cause, the risk chain that caused it, it helps you with risk ranking and rating, I should say, and it helps you with identifying the key control that's missing. Uh, analysis should always be something you put into action. So, you know, what are some of the top ten best practices or top five best practices in this case? Uh, where is it happening? Where are these vulnerabilities coming into play across our web apps or client server or web service apps? Where, where are they? So ability to get vulnerability data and to uh, you know, triage that data in a way to make it actionable. Uh, this leads to initiatives within your organization to stomp out maybe certain vulnerability types that you might have in your organization. Uh, when it comes to expect the model, you know, you, it, when you get to the uh, boardroom or you get to the CISO or you get to the management meeting on a regular basis, you got to put it back in the red, yellow, green, um, just the way it goes. And trying to get a dashboard of what you actually have and where you are is very important. So trying to work uh, a good set of metrics around your assurance is an important piece. All right, let me just uh, summarize. So baseline. Um, and roadmap is the number one thing you do in your AppSec program. Get, get, get something that you're going after you're shooting for. Make sure the roadmap is very tailored. Um, know what you have and know what's expected. That is the hardest part of an AppSec program. But it's the most valuable part and it's the most rewarding part when it comes to collaborating with the development community. Because you're going to need them to figure this all out. Um, cost effective coverage. You know, just because you can gain coverage and you can do all these things by, you know, performing all these activities doesn't mean it's the most cost-effective way. You know, what, what risk are you trying to uh, go after? Empower the developer. And then the other, the last piece of this is make it real, the visibility you provide. I would stop talking about vulns all the time. Let's start right now talking about what's expected, what's actual, and where we are in assurance and coverage. It starts changing the mindset. It starts, you know, Developers stop, stop looking at us as uh, auditors in, in this field, right? We are collaborators with them. And if we're going to have any success with DevOps or any type of scale and automation, we definitely need to work uh, much closer with the development community. So that's all I have. Um, what kind of time do I have here? What, what are we working on? About five minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions, okay. 
Uh, any questions out there? I threw a lot at you. So, yes. Um, is there a mic or something? Or? Oh, okay, got it. Sorry. Speak loudly, please. <laughs> Yeah, so from uh, the question is, you know, how do you determine the classification or the, uh, the, the inherent risk? So um, we, we typically uh, try and keep it simple. Uh, there's, you know, we, we, we come up with 20 areas, but again, it's not just uh, the um, confidentiality and, and, and integrity and availability kind of stuff, that we, or, or PII, you're saying data sensitivity. So uh, what we typically do is incorporate attack surface information in there for higher risk areas. And we typically would try and do a calibration of the scores so that it, not everything falls into the high bucket. And then with each one, like if you have high risk applications, you have to define the level of rigor, activity, and what, you, what is required in each one. So I hope I answered your question. I didn't, I didn't quite hear everything. But if you have others, I'll take it afterwards as well. Any, any other questions? I only have a couple more minutes here. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the question is, uh, you, I showed the graph of the initial broad-based scan, um, and then we deepen the scan. What does that mean? Um, typically when you, uh, let's say you're doing some static analysis and you were to run the static analysis, the, the first time through and, and to get through so many uh, applications, you're typically setting your filter levels fairly low. You might be even setting your vulnerability types to a certain, and, uh, to a certain set, right? You might be top three, top four vulnerabilities that the organization has experienced, as well as you're, um, you're looking for just a high uh, you know, high probability findings, if you will. By deepening the scan, you can do a couple different things. You can increase the filter with more triaging, but when you are triaging the results and false positives, you can also increase the data flow and function flow through the static analysis. So if you have that improvement loop going back in, every time you run that scan again, you're going to be getting deeper into data paths, deeper into functional paths, and you'll be getting more accurate results. And the false, you'll be you know, reducing false positives. So that, that's the deeping part of the scan. Yes? Yeah, so the question is how do you plan to, you know, how do you uh, calculate coverage? So uh, one of the things that we, we try and do is when you identify your expected model of a particular application, you should have the number of control points that you're trying to validate from that. So if you have five levels of authorization, you have you know, authentication at three, four different points, they become all functional points that you want to see a data path to and something that validates it. So uh, when you run your scans, you have a lot of information in those scans. You have a lot of information in, in, the, in the whole data path from, you know, from source to sync. So you, you can uh, do some analysis and reverse engineer that analysis to the control points. Very difficult to do, but it's very important to get that coverage. Otherwise, yeah, I tested authentication. Well, there's five authentication entries into this system. Um, some are back-end authentication, some are front-end. You know, I just tested the front door. That was it, but you know, I checked the box, I'm done. Well, you're not. You have four others that you have to take a look at to, to have coverage. So you got to get to the kind of the functional points and the control points uh, in your expected model. Uh, it, it all depends on how far into the SDLC you can get. If you can get to build automation or you can get even further back with um, you know, some of these sensors. Some things, once you understand the expected model, and let's say you have a good framework that you're using and configuration set for that framework for security, you can do checks right off the bat, right? And, or you can check for patterns within your, your application to verify that those patterns are there at each of the interface points. You can do that with scripting, right? You know, you know zap and, you know, and, and put some zest around it and throw it into a, uh, you know, a Jenkins build, and you now have more and more coverage as you go through that. So 
Uh, again, you have to you have to understand these tools and you have to understand the application to be successful. That's why the collaboration is so important. Because alone, we're not going to get there. We're, it's going to be tough to get real with application security unless the developers are, are part of what we're doing. Any other questions? I think I'm out of time. And then we've got to give the, uh, the other folks. Okay. If you do have other questions, I'll, I'll hang out outside for a little bit and uh, be happy to address it. Thank you very much.